This film is lit, the podcast where we finally settle the score on one simple question. Is the book really better than the movie? I'm Brian, and I have a film degree, so I watch the movie, but don't read the book. And I'm Katie. I have an English degree, so I do things the right way and read the book before we watch the movie. So prepare to be wowed by our expertise and charm as we dissect all of your favorite film adaptations and decide if the silver screen or the written word did it better. So turn it up, settle in, and get ready for spoilers, because this film is lit. The untold true story of the black women who helped launch our nation into space. It's Hidden Figures, and this film is lit. Hello and welcome back to This Film's Lit, the podcast where we talk about movies that are based on books. In this week's episode, we're discussing, is this our first, like, non-fiction? No, no, um... I know we did no, Black Klansman, yeah, Black Klansman, but that was also felt slightly different. Maybe it's not. I guess it's similar because the movie was much more of a like not trying to be a like biographical. I mean, it was to some extent, but it was also much more stylized potentially. At least like it sold itself as much more stylized. I feel like yeah, that Maybe. one was more stylized uh, than this one was. But uh, that's true. Black Klansman, yeah, was also based on a uh, like a. He wrote that book himself. It was a memoir. Yeah. Uh, yeah, a memoir. Um, so it's like our second nonfiction book. So this one will be interesting because it is based on historical events. Um, uh, somewhat, uh, the movie ch- ch- probably changed a few things, and we'll talk about that. Uh, probably changed quite a bit. Uh, I, I found some research, and there's a, there's a lot to talk about with that, but we'll get to that when we get to that. Uh, we have most of our normal segments. We have a short Guess Who segment, but first, in case you haven't seen Hidden Figures, here's a brief... Let me sum up. Let me explain. No, there is too much. Let me sum up. So, my, let me sum up. This week's not going to be super long, or I'm not going to detail the plot of the film, because you should just go read uh, the Wikipedia article for, like, this like this movie, or the book, uh, or about Katherine Johnson, or Dorothy Vaughn, or... Um, Mary Jackson. Mary Jackson, or any... Uh, there's other people, but those are the three that are just featured in the film. Just let yourself fall down a Wikipedia rabbit yeah. hole. Just follow down that Wikipedia rabbit hole, because it's really worth it and really interesting. But basically, it tells the story of... Uh, the movie focuses on uh, three black women uh, who worked for NASA in the nineteen early 19, late 1950s, early 1960s. They worked, Some of them worked there longer or whatever. But this we're watching in the film in, in the early 1960s that during the heat of the space race uh, in our America's attempt to get their first man into space and into orbit. And uh, it, it kind of follows the story of these black women who were, who were computers at NASA. Uh, and they did all, all like the calculations and the math. And some of them did different things. Like we learned that Mary Jackson was kind of did more engineering stuff and she kind of ventured down that path eventually Dorothy was did more with like computing uh over the course of her career eventually and Katherine Johnson who's the main character arguably of the film uh is and is probably the most well known of the yeah, of the three so. she she specifically received like the presidential medal of freedom and all that sort of stuff um she was a a she calculated uh, uh flight trajectories and all kinds of stuff like that um, for the Apollo mission, Apollo Eleven, uh, some of the space shuttle missions, and specifically um, John Glenn's the first uh, manned orbit of Earth. So, uh, kind of covers their story, their struggles within NASA and the system, uh, the kind of little bit of their personal life, uh, and their ways they work their way through the system and deal with the racism and the sexism of that era. Uh, and uh, ultimately ends up with, and this isn't a spoiler, John Glenn successfully completing his orbit of Earth, uh, thanks in no small part to Katherine Johnson's calculations uh, of certain aspects of the orbit and that sort of thing. So uh, that's the rough story, but again, just go check out the the Wikipedia article for any of these uh, women or, or the, the book itself because it really is fascinating and worth really diving into like the actual history of which we will not get into in super depth here because it's very complicated and very detailed and it would take, we'd have to write, uh, you know. Uh, We would have to do so much research. Yeah, it would take a ton of research. And uh, I want, there's a a few, like, we're not going to go, that's one thing I'll say now, we're not going to go through and detailed 
um, nitpick everything in the movie that wasn't accurate to real life yeah. and everything that was and oh vice God, versa. We'd be here for hours. We'd be here forever because for one thing, the movie did change quite a bit of, of certain aspects and, and obviously dramatized a lot of things. And we'll get into what some of those things are, but uh, we're not going to go through and you're not going to get every little detail of, well, this, I, I, I'm going to ask about a lot of those. And was that in the book? Because the book is, you know, a little more accurate, not a little, a, a lot more, if not completely yeah. accurate to real life. Um, Whereas the film embellishes a lot of things. I'm going to ask about some of that, but we're not going to hit every detail. So if there's something we don't cover and you're like, well, that didn't, that's not real. Sorry. <laughs> we, we know that there's lots of things that were changed, uh, but we can't get to all of them. All right, let's go ahead and do Guess Who. Who are you? No one of consequence. I must know. Get used to disappointment. Okay. So I wasn't expecting to have Guess Who for this I wasn't one. either. Um, but we do have two descriptions of characters who are also in the movie. I had a couple more, but I had to cut them because those characters don't show up. Gotcha. All right. There was something in her bearing that transcended her soft voice and diminutive stature. Her eyes dominated her lovely caramel-hued face, almond-shaped, wide-set, and tense eyes that seemed to see everything. I, it's hard to, to say for sure. Um, the thing I'm looking at most is the soft voice and diminutive stature and trying to compare that to the movie characters mm-hmm. in terms of like who who that best reflects. And I would say that that would probably be Katherine Johnson or Katherine Goebel. Um, she is the most soft spoken of the three main characters in the film at times yeah. there are times in the movie where she's not but in general she's a, a little more reserved than especially than Mary Jackson and a little bit you could argue make an argument for uh Dorothy that, but I'm going to say that that's Katherine Johnson it's actually Dorothy Vaughn that was my I, I could have seen it go either way because she also is, is similar in terms of the mm-hmm. the um yeah being shorter or the diminutive stature and a soft voice but yeah, I can see it. Like I said, I could have gone either way. All right, so our next one is super short. Serious and bespectacled with fine curly hair. Okay. Um, well, assuming... Uh, I, I mean, this could be... Assuming this is also one of the main three characters featured in the movie, uh, the only one that has glasses is Katherine Johnson. Um, and she is quite serious. Uh, and she does have curly hair uh, at different times. Around. Yeah, she has curly hair. Um, and so that would be make the most sense. I'm trying to think if there's anybody else in NASA or anything that are characters that... And from my understanding, the, uh, most of the other characters in this movie are not real people necessarily. They're they're generally like conglomerations of people and that sort of thing. So my guess would be that this is Katherine Johnson. Yes, okay. it is. <laughs> God, if I just keep guessing Katherine Johnson, I'd get it right eventually. So... <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, that was, that was interesting that Dorothy got such a, a, a sort of in-depth description. The book actually spends a lot of time with Dorothy. Yeah. She was there the longest. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I remember reading that or seeing that. Yeah, they talk about she, it in the movie. she started working there um, when it was still NACA yeah. um, during the Second World War. Well, I thought they were also there during NACA. And the, the movie just changes yeah. it to NASA. I'm pretty sure yeah. they, it was also NASA when they were there. Yeah, could it be was. Wrong about, yeah. It was. But um, yeah, Mary Jackson and Katherine Johnson didn't get there till a little yeah. later. Like like in the late 50s or something like 59 or yeah. 60 or something like that. Mary Jackson might have been there a little bit before. Yeah, that, but but, uh, but in the movie, uh, uh, Dorothy Vaughn does mention that she's been there for yes, 10 years does. or not, yeah. you know, however, almost 10 years or something like that. Yeah. Um, and in the, in the very opening scene, I think they talk about how her, her having been there longer than them or something like mm-hmm. that. So, yep. All right. Uh, and she is a fascinating character. When I, I was going and read, I did some reading as we were watching the movie on her Wikipedia page. And I was like, holy cow, the movie could have been about her entirely. Yeah. And it would have been just as <laughs> interesting as being about uh, oh, she Catherine She was Johnson. very smart and incredibly, like, savvy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, and that's and we'll get into it. And was that in the book? Because I had some questions about that. I was this. It felt almost like a movie thing, like her where her storyline goes. Yeah, felt like something right out of a movie. And I looked it up, and it's no, that is exactly what <laughs> happened in real life. And I was like, all right, but I'm still gonna ask it for the for the benefit of our listeners. All right, let's go ahead and get to. Was that in the book? Nicholas Flamel is the only known maker of the Philosopher's Stone. The what? Honestly, don't you two read? All right, in the opening scene of the film, uh, their car breaks down, and they have an encounter uh, with a white police officer in rural rural Virginia. Uh, you know, kind of set the mood for the film. And uh, he's a jerk, but eventually decides to give them an escort to work because they're running late. Yeah, and they work for NASA. And they work for he's NASA. He's impressed by and that. And he's impressed by the fact that they work for NASA and that they hire women. Um, <laughs> <laughs> beat, beat women so many um, charming viewpoints <laughs> yeah 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 oh yeah it's just whew, a real cross section there of uh yeah of uh char- charm um <laughs> but uh, so he gives them a, a police escort and they're flying down the road and it's a fun opening scene i assume this is a, a movie edition that is a movie edition. there's no re- recollect there's no story there's about no them. recounting of that okay, no. anything like that all right that's kind of what i figured that felt like a movie thing uh, at least the, the the escort part. I'm sure I wouldn't be surprised if they're you know the encounters with <laughs> police officers in rural I'm Virginia. Sure. I'm sure were numerous and uh, very fun. So uh, we, as we're introduced to Mary Jackson's character, she goes into work and she's they're all assigned to different sort of departments within NASA. And again, I'm just going to call it NASA throughout the course of the film because that's or throughout the course of the discussion because that's what it is in the film. Even mm-hmm. though, and they just did that for the sake of the viewer to make things. Again, whether I don't know for sure. I'd have to. I, I should have looked up exactly when that change took place, um, and when it. Be, who you know, it, maybe it was NASA time, but my understanding is that it was NACA when they were there, at least at the beginning of when yeah, they were there for most of the time they were there, yeah. I believe. Uh, and, and then it changed, but uh, so we're just gonna call it NASA though, just for the sake yeah. of ease, like the movie did. But Mary Jackson gets assigned to like uh, the work on the Mercury, um, the actual. Uh, a space, uh, the capsule that mm-hmm. comes down um, to do sort of calculations and stuff for that uh, as they're kind of engineering the, the the Mercury capsule. And as she's walking in to her assignment, she's walking through the wind tunnel where they're doing like a, a wind test on this thing. And her shoe gets caught in, in a grate on the floor. Her heel does. And she almost gets hit by a Mach 1 wind tunnel jet because they can't stop the countdown with a person in there. And it's, again, very clearly to me, I was like, well, this is not a thing that happened. How did she get in there? How did they, yeah. Uh, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that that wasn't in the book, but I'm going to ask. You know, I'm not going to say it never happened. Right. But it wasn't in the it book. It wasn't in the book. Yeah, again, there's a lot of those little moments that felt, I was like, okay, that yeah, it's a movie. It's a movie thing. Uh, this is a specific line uh, that uh, it was a great line. Uh, I loved it, and I wanted. I was like wondering if there was any some anything similar in the book or like a the actual line. I, I would guess probably not the actual line. It's too much of a movie line, but maybe the some, some, that kind of thing. The uh, she's ta- uh, Mary Jackson is talking to the head engineer or whatever on the Mercury capsule program, and I can't remember his name now. He's a Polish Jew. He says. Um, and I looked that guy up, and his name in real life is slightly different than the name of the character, but basically the same. Um, and he says, uh, she, he's like, you should be an engineer. And she says, uh, well, I, I, you know, I, I, they won't let me be an engineer or whatever. Like the, or, you know, I, I don't think I can do that. And he says, if you were a white man, w- would you wish to be an engineer? And she, she responds to him and says, well, if I were a white man, I, I wouldn't have to wish. I'd already be one. And I, it was a great line. Uh, it's, a, it's a good trailer line. It's a great line, though. Uh, is that was that in the book from the book? Um, I do recall there being a line in the book with this sentiment. I don't remember exactly what it is. Yeah. Um, but it I, rung I, a bell though somewhere. Yeah, I don't think any of the characters actually said it though. I think it was just in the text. Yeah, that, and that's fair. It does feel very clearly like a not a thing. A, I'm not a, not a, not a thing a person would say, but just you know. It, it's it's a very uh, Hollywood line, mm-hmm. uh, but it's a, it's a great line. And it does capture a very specific and relevant um, point, makes a very specific and relevant point that is very true, <laughs> regardless yeah. of whether or not the line actually happened. Yeah. So then Catherine gets assigned to uh, the space task group 
uh, to help the calculations as they're trying. It's basically like the main group that is trying to get the Mercury missions off the ground and going and um, the Mercury 7 missions. And as she shows up on her first day, uh, she's walking in with some binders and stuff. And uh, one of the engineers, one of the guys working there, mistakes her, hands her a trash can and says, this wasn't taken out last night. Mistakes her for, like, the help uh, for a janitor, that sort of thing. Is that, was that an event that was recounted in the book? Twas not. Yeah. Okay. We're going to get into the discussion of the depiction of racism at NASA a little bit over the course of this because it is interesting. Uh, I think it's. It has its high, it has its strengths and its weaknesses in the film, mm-hmm. and we'll talk about it. But it is it's interesting, and I remember I think I remember hearing specifically in an interview that Katherine Johnson said this never happened to her. Uh, and then does Katherine Johnson have to run and find the color bathroom because she has to go to the bathroom? And this is a major plot point in the film that every day she has to run like a, a half mile to the west, uh, whatever it's yeah, called, to the west campus, the west campus, uh, which is where the uh, uh, the the black um, computers are and they have their own colored restrooms there. And so that's where she's going to the restroom every day. Uh, is that, did that happen? So there is a similar ish scene in the book. It's not a major plot point. It's not right. something that happens over and over. It's kind of like a one and done scene. Um, and it's actually Mary, oh, okay. not Catherine, um, who goes out on an assignment to a different part of the campus and, um, ask some white women where the bathroom is, and they're like similar to in the movie. Like, yeah, we don't know where your, know we don't know where your is. bathroom yeah. is. But it's kind of like that one instance. Yeah. of it happening. Yeah. So, but it is something that the movie took inspiration from, and, and yes. sort of used it as a indicative of the situation. Which yeah, makes sense. Uh, is John Glenn this super nice white guy who's sh- who's gonna shake everybody's hand? Gosh darn it. We didn't Do really we, we didn't really un- interact much with John Glenn I in the had book. A feeling. Maybe he was a really nice guy. I don't know. I did some research. I mean, and so he had a very long uh, political career after um uh he was an astronaut yeah. uh, and he was a fairly progressive dude in general. Uh he not on everything all the time. Uh if you do, I like I said I did a very cursory a bit of research and uh so he was a democrat his whole career uh as a politician. Uh, his voting um, record was, in general, fairly progressive. The main thing that I saw that he his voting record was not good on was same sex marriage. But most people, and he was a, he was from like the seventies to the nineties. He yeah. was a politician, so I'm not saying I'm not forgiving. I'm just saying that like it's that's. But he 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 was very much in favor of. He was voting for uh like in act, or keeping uh he, he he didn't vote against affirmative action type things and uh he was a f- big proponent of voting to fund like um minority and female uh like business grants and that sort of thing hmm. so like he did a fair amount of progressive stuff but also in his early days at NASA I read specifically there was some like around this time uh there were some issues where there he he had some remarks during a subcommittee hearing or something about women being astronauts and about how that's not the way society works or something but that later in his career he changed on that and actually was a proponent for women in the space and that sort of thing so it's a very complicated he seems like a a relatively progressive but also a a, a sort of seems like a maybe a, 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 a just a normal person who like takes in new information and, and tries change, to be better sometimes but yeah tries to be better but also has made also some makes some mistakes yeah. yeah but in general seemed like a pretty good dude from everything i read again i did a very cursory glance um so it seems like what i my, my point that i'm getting at is this seems like that interaction what they were going for in the movie was sort of trying to be representative of that with him being a bit more of a progressive person within nasa compared to some of the other people they're trying to represent that in this little interaction where he goes and shakes the hands of mm-hmm. all the uh, the black computers who are there in the line. But not a real event as far as recounted in but, the book. Yeah, as far as we know. Yeah. Uh, there's a plot point in the book that, or in the movie, that Catherine, when she's doing her calculations, has to, they keep giving her, like, the the you know, the binders full of the stuff she has to check, and, like, a lot of it's redacted because she doesn't have the classification level or whatever to be able to look at it um and so she like it, it becomes a thing and of ultimately she figures out what they're doing and it's like this it's this weird plot point where she she does some calculations and then she sees the name she holds the 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 paper up to the light and sees the name of like a spit of a classified 
rocket they're working on through the paper. And then so she writes that into one of her calculations and is like, this rocket will work. And they're like, how do you know about that? And she explains that she <laughs> looked at it through the light. And they're like, oh, and it's a fun scene. But was any of that recounted in the book? Is that a true to life um, thing? No. Okay. Not recounted in the book. Yeah. I think because from what I do understand is that eventually she, she does get into like the classified meetings or whatever in mm-hmm. real life in the book. And that maybe this was an extension of that storyline. It's possible. Because yeah. that is, I do remember reading that she does, and I don't think I asked about this, but she does um, have like badger her way into like the specific meetings that of like the higher ups or whatever. Mm-hmm. She basically just keeps like <laughs> badgering them into letting her go. And eventually they do kind of like we see in the movie. Um, and so anyways, I think they were just trying to kind of, do an extension yeah. of that and then yeah. give some more antagonism for uh what's his name's character? <laughs> the uh dude from Big Bang Theory. Oh, Jim Parsons. Jim Parsons character. Does Mary Jackson have to go to high school to become an engineer because she doesn't have some sort of technical degree thing that She's she's missing some classes. She's missing some classes even though she has a BA from Yeah. So she's a university. she's missing some classes that they require at NASA. Yes. Yeah. So she is taking those classes at, as night classes and they're held at the high school. Yeah. Okay. So she's not like going she's back not going to, to high take school. high school right. classes. Right. That's what I cuz they originally said college classes and then she was saying about going to a high school and I was really confused but yeah. it's because they were at they yeah, they're being school, held they at were the high school. school. Okay. Um and then in the movie in order to get in because it's seg- they're in Virginia and it's still segregated uh she basically goes to court and has to convince the judge to let her take these classes even though, you know, it's a segregated school. Is that happened in the book? Was that um, true so the Mary book? Jackson does in the book attend classes at a segregated high school in order to apply to be an engineer at NASA. And the book does mention that she had to get special permission in order to do that, but it doesn't go into detail about like how she got gotcha. that permission. I, I did see a note about this in the Wikipedia section. So if you do want to go into detail, and who knows how accurate all of it is, but the, the Wikipedia section, uh, the Wikipedia article for this movie has a whole section, as I mentioned in the prequel, that is about the historical accuracy. And this specifically, they mentioned that she did get special permission from, like, she basically just, like, asked somebody with the city or something, yeah. and they, like, uh, she didn't have to go, like, argue her case in court, but, like, she did like write them a letter or something, and they like said sure and let her take the classes. Mm-hmm. So they just be, uh, they amped up the drama of that sort of process in the film, but it wasn't too dissimilar in the sense that she did have to convince somebody to let her do it. Yeah, yeah. And this one was uh, interesting because I didn't I hadn't heard this part of the story. I knew a lot about Catherine Johnson, but I didn't know anything about uh, Dorothy. And in the movie, she realizes that as they're installing this big IBM, this big. Uh, the computer, the thing, uh, to sort of take over the jobs of the computers, the people, uh, Dorothy sees this happening and realizes we, we gotta learn how, I gotta learn how to use that thing, how to program that thing. Cause otherwise I'm not going to have a job in, in you know, a year or whatever. Uh, and she does, she teaches herself how to program it. Um, and then, so one, does that happen? And then two in the movie, she like, they can't figure out how to work it. And she just like walks in and fixes it. She like, kicks it and it like and, and not really she she switches some wires around or whatever it felt very movie nonsense yeah. where she's like that's in the wrong she spot plug. Kind of fonzie it a little yeah bit, a little yeah. bit of a fonzie is like bang and it works and they're like it's putting out numbers <laughs> I'm like oh, i don't know but uh the, that whole thing is that in the book um so the kind of fonzie moment no okay um there's no recounting of her like going in and making the computer work. right like yeah she um but she was incredibly clever and um, business savvy and realized that she needed to make sure she was keeping up with the times. So she did make sure that she knew how to do the programming and feed the numbers into the computer so that she could still have a job there. Yeah. When the computer eventually made her initial job obsolete. Yeah. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that, so there's this big moment in the movie where Katherine Johnson, uh, after she has to run in the rain to go use the, the colored restroom, um, she's, she's soaking wet and she comes back and uh, Kevin Costner's character, Al something, is yelling, I was giving her guff for not being there, and she, she explodes on him. 
and like starts yelling at him in the whole room about having to run through the rain and how she doesn't get paid and enough and all this. And it felt very out of character in that moment to me from everything we'd seen from her. I, I get the sort of cathartic um, release and like this built up, you know, tension that she'd been dealing with and, and sort of the just like this is the moment where she's like enough of this bullshit. Mm-hmm. But it does feel a little strange and it felt very specifically like one a movie moment, but two that given the times that given the, <laughs> given the way society worked at the time, that if she had done that, she would very quickly not have had a job in that. Like, yeah. Yeah. yeah you know what I mean? Just like screaming at a whole room full of people and, 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 and your boss specifically. And they all just like realize, Oh, she's right. Like that's where she like earns their, <laughs> I don't know, their white approval or whatever. <laughs> but like, it does feel like, uh, oof. Yeah, that felt like not a thing that actually happened. <laughs> it's not. It's not <laughs> recounted in the book. Okay. Um, and you know, having we were watching that scene, and all I could think about was the what Catherine Johnson, the real Catherine mm-hmm. Johnson, supposedly said about her portrayal in the film, which was that she was never so aggressive. Yeah. Um, that's probably that. That's the one scene. Yeah, she that's been that is about. the the. The, the scene yeah um and i i can see having watched it why she might have been t- a bit taken aback yeah at her portrayal um it, it makes for definitely an interesting and dramatic yeah scene and it's definitely like kind of a, a character arc yeah for her and a turning point and stories need that yeah and it's I cathartic for us as a viewer like you you know you want her to have that moment mm-hmm. it, it, it you want it to to have that moment, but it also feels like, yeah. Well, and yeah. we're talking about, it, but yeah, it, yeah. It, yeah. And I, I feel like I, I probably understand maybe why she would have felt that way in real life, because I, I do feel like, especially older generations, I think tend to pride themselves on like proper conduct and manners and yeah. that type of thing. Yeah, you know. Yeah, and Catherine Johnson has also spoke at length, and I, I don't know if we want to get it into it necessarily here because we will talk about it maybe in the odds and ends part a little bit about sort of the portrayal of racism and that sort of thing. But she did talk a lot. She has gone on record several times about how she actually never felt discriminated against at NASA. Mm -hmm. Um, She said she knew it existed and that like, it's not that like to downplay it, but that she never, never personally felt that way. That's kind of the vibe I got from the book. Yeah. Yeah. That's what she said. Um, And, and sort of the vibe and like, apparently it was a much more, the way she described it in interviews and stuff after the, and again, this is all after the fact, you know, years later was that she, uh, that everybody was just there to do a job and we all hung out and, and got along and went and played cards at lunch and it was like fine. And now again, that doesn't mean that it wasn't there and that maybe she didn't maybe it, it, like the experiences can be different for different levels of different people within the organization and all that sort of thing. Um, and I, I, I do wonder how, I don't know it's interesting it's interesting because you can't like discount her mm-hmm. sort of firsthand experience of living yeah. through that. you know what yeah. i mean um but at the same time you find it hard to believe that in 1960 in virginia <laughs> that- the, the, yeah the book does mention that at least based on the interviews that the author did i, I guess we'll we'll put that caveat in yeah. there that most of the like day to day kind of racism came from more like the the lower tier, like yeah. the blue collar workers yeah. that were there and that kind of thing, and not as much from like the more educated higher up. Which makes sense too, to some like, extent. Even yeah. then, it's this are the more educated people in the country at the time, you know, and it, that does tend to lean towards a at least a slightly more progressive. Yeah, sort of view on the world, so it, it's not completely out, yeah. outlandish. Well, to and then that... too, it mentions too, like a lot of like the engineers and those like like the 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 scientists. I don't know the word I'm looking for here. Um, yeah, engineers. Are, yeah, yeah. Um, they were from the West Coast, or they yeah. were from New York. A lot of them were Jewish, or they yeah. were immigrants. Yeah. So yeah, I mean that's we we see a little bit of that in that one scene between Mary Jackson and uh, her mentor, which mm-hmm. apparently that guy that 
that actual human in real life was like Mary Jackson's kind of like her mentor. Yeah. Is what I read in yeah. the article or in. Um, he was in the book. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so uh, I, I also think it's um, I think the movie actually does an OK job of that at times is that it does. The movie doesn't do what, what I will say to the benefit of sort of the depiction of racism and <laughs> and stuff in the film is that it doesn't do a lot of the like heavy handed like only the people who like say the n word at the at people and like yeah scowl at them are like the movie isn't saying that like those are the only racists right it, now it kind of does a little bit at the end uh, and we'll talk about it because some of those characters kind of get redeemed because like the sort of more casually racist people kind of like ultimately are like not racist at the yeah. end magically um but the movie does i think at least somewhat sort of depict the fact that the 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 racism that 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 was that she was experiencing there wasn't wasn't people like get out of here you know like yeah ah. it wasn't like violent over like, the top yeah yeah like like classic depictions of right. you know like what everybody's like oh well that's clearly racism it's more of people just like giving her weird looks and like you know not taking her seriously and not thinking she yeah. can be good at her job you know like and sort of casually it, it's not oh uh i you know like kirsten dunn we'll talk about a whole thing about kirsten dunn's character but and like her her sort of thing with dorothy where it's like she's nice to her but like doesn't recommend her for uh what yeah, you call for, it like this for promotion like for supervisor, for supervisor yeah. roles because you know for unstated reasons and that sort of thing so i i think that that's kind of all good in the sense like the way that those depict like in general but we'll get more into some of the details about other ways that i think it's like not great potentially later is there a bathroom sign scene where uh kevin costner's character is equivalent in the book because i know he's not a real character he is but they changed him. He's like a conglomeration of people. Uh, knocks the colored bathroom sign off the wall after he finds out Catherine has to run to the bat. Obviously, she didn't do this, so I'm guessing this isn't in the book. And it's way too dramatic of a movie moment to actually be a book thing or a real life thing. But he like takes this uh, crowbar and rips the sign off the wall, and then <laughs> in 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 a great line it says, "Here at NASA, we all pee the same color," which. Whoever came up with that one, I don't, okay. <laughs> a whole room of writers yeah. <laughs> came up with that one. Yeah, that was the best they could do. Yeah, um, this scene was wow. <laughs> it's something. <laughs> it's something. Uh, it's like it's it's a little. I will say heavy-handed. Literally, all the white people are standing on one side of the hall. All the black people are standing on the other side oh of the hall. Oh, my God. And he's just <laughs> hacking at it with a crowbar. <laughs> and they're all just watching. And I'm like, wow. Oh, and this is definitely one of those scenes that uh, when people criticize sort of uh, this film with the um, and band it under some of the other uh, white savior tropey films. This yeah. is one of those scenes where that comes from, especially because yeah. you haven't specifically answered, but it's not historically accurate this isn't a thing that happened this isn't in the book no this is not a, it's not in the book yeah <laughs> this is a movie edition specifically to sort of but you know what is interesting i will like i mentioned earlier i will say that it does reflect an attitude that Catherine johnson herself says was part of nasa in the sense that if you were there doing the job most of the, at least the higher ups and that yeah. sort of thing, all saw each other as you know, like yeah, we're here to do this we're thing. We're here to like, do this thing. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Like you know, it, our, what color we are, anything like that. We're Americans, damn it. Um, and so like I, I could argue, I could see an argument that it, like it is trying to reflect that her like Catherine Johnson's own reported experience of that attitude at NASA, but it is a very heavy handed and um, tropey and vaguely problematic way about. Of going yeah. about that, I feel yeah. like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I just and I said this while we were watching it. Wouldn't it make more sense for him to be knocking down yes. the white yes. bathroom? This is sign? the other thing that's so. That's the other thing that makes it so funny is because it doesn't really make sense because he goes to the bathroom that she has to run to, yeah, which is like a mile away. 
the he bathroom should... that she doesn't want to have to go to yes. anymore. Yes. So he knocks it off. So now white people can use that bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> and now I get the sentiment. I get but it would the make... sentiment and the symbolism, but yeah. it doesn't make sense. And now I, the idea is it wouldn't be as dramatic because if he went to the, the whites only bathroom, it would just be like a little placard or whatever, yeah. I guess is the idea. But still, I think you could, I think it would have been more dramatic is if you want to do that scene is when she says that he like uh, she's yelling at him and he's standing there because this feels like an inserted scene, too, because it doesn't even really make sense. Like with, when it happens, yeah. like he yells at her and then like the scene fades out and then we cut in and he's breaking the sign down Yeah, he's and, breaking the sign and they're all there for and they're some all reason. there yeah but we don't see them get there it just yeah. feels like a, an inserted like we need this dramatic moment at, like what would what, what would have made sense is that she yells at him and then he he's like and then he just doesn't say anything and he just walks out into the hallway and they all kind of like follow him out there and he walks over to the whites only bathroom and pulls the whites only thing off and throws it in the trash or something and then walks back. You know what I mean? Yeah. Something a little more subtle. Like it's not yeah. subtle, but like that's not hitting you with a crowbar. It's like literally not hitting you with a crowbar. Yeah. If he just walk and it also makes sense too. And, and like, OK, yeah, use this bathroom. Yeah. Like because this is that makes sense with what she's saying. Like it, it just <laughs> The whole thing felt like so un uh it sells so cheap and so like just undercooked yeah. like oh we need this big moment of we got to put this in the trailer this is definitely a thing yeah, in the trailer this is a trailer thing hitting yeah. a colored Kevin only Costner bathroom sign hacking away with the sign with a crowbar yeah wow that scene was something yeah it was something else they no. could have even <laughs> kept the line about peeing all the same yeah, color they, throws it in the trash can yeah. here at nasa we all pee the same color yeah, yeah. and it, it would feel so much more real and so much yeah. less like this okay what a, you know it would just feel like because <laughs> that would actually make sense and that feels like even something a nasa guy would do is like or like a, you know he's like this engineer like high up engineer or whatever just the practical like i'm gonna go fix this problem uh, yeah. by like just pulling the sign off the door he's like there problem solved or whatever like you know what i mean <laughs> versus like all right everybody come with me we're gonna go on a hike and i'm gonna bring my crowbar and they're gonna watch me bang at this sign for 10 minutes it's like very yeah it just doesn't fit in with like it doesn't it doesn't fit in with his character really it doesn't fit in and it doesn't make sense yeah it's a it's a weird scene uh so she finally gets in we talked about earlier she finally gets into like the classified meetings that they're uh that uh, jim parsons and kevin costner go to every day that where they're like making all the big decisions and she Mm -hmm. finds out about afterwards the room where it happens the room where it happens and she finds out about afterwards and has to change all her calculations because, you know, she's doing calculations and the chain, blah, blah, blah. And so she's like, I need to be in the room because then I can find out what's going on as it happens. Um, and she gets in there and I read that this, that, that did happen, that she did eventually, maybe not that specific meeting or whatever, but she gets into some sort of editorial board. She gets into some sort of higher up meeting by like pestering her way into it. But, uh, in the movie, in the scene, she goes to the meeting and then Kevin Costner hands her a piece of chalk and is like, math at us. <laughs> <laughs> Show us your worth. <laughs> and she's like, okay. <laughs> and she goes up to the board and um, and it's also, I, this is another moment that could feel a little like she gets in the room. And I know the idea is like he he believes in her and he wants to like, but it also feels a little bit of like dance yeah like it's like he uh you know i don't know but i it's not what they're going for but eh. um but it, but she goes up there and she does this big it's dramatic music starts playing and she calculates the no go no go whatever I gotta azimuth i love a dramatic uh, the, math yeah. scene yeah it puts uh it puts uh uh finding for no um goodwill hunting <laughs> to shame i almost said finding force that's a different movie what is that He's thinking of Finding Neverland. No, there's a movie called Finding Forrester that's no, like I've it's never slightly, seen that one. But uh, a good it puts Goodwill Hunting to shame. I don't even know if there are dramatic math scenes in that, but there probably is, um, based on the <laughs> what I remember of the what is Finding Forrester. Finding Forrester is a 2000 film. A unique relationship develops between an eccentric reclusive reclusive novelist and a young, amazingly gifted scholar athlete. After the novelist discovers the young athlete is also an excellent writer and Sulu takes him on as a protege, they develop an unlikely friendship. That sounds like Oscar bait. It does. It was directed by Gus Van Zant, and it stars, uh, <laughs> it stars, uh, <laughs> oh, Sean Connery, 
and Rob Brown. Wow. Oh, this might be the the uh, white savior. The movie, like the movie. I mean, it's it's. I look at this picture. Look at look at that. Oh, wow. <laughs> it's Sean Connery at his Sean Conneryest, and then a Rob Brown in like the most nineties urban clothes that they could come up with. <laughs> And he's uh, he's he's teaching him how to write or something. I don't know, <laughs> but that movie might not have aged well. <laughs> anyways, <laughs> never seen it, so I have no idea. But anyways, uh, that scene, the dramatic math scene. I went on a tangent there. Dramatic math scene. <laughs> um, she does eventually get into some of the higher up um, meetings. That particular scene is not recounted in the book. Okay. Uh, so eventually, uh, after uh, Catherine gets engaged uh, um, to Mahershala Ali, yes, and uh, J- Jim Johnson, I believe is his name, uh, Colonel Jim Johnson, something, yes, something along those lines. Um, and she gets engaged, and then she gets fired from not fired, but she gets reassigned from the sp- space task group because they don't need a calculator anymore. And as she's leaving, the whole group has bought her pearls because during her yig big yelly scene. She said that she can't afford pearls on her, the budget that, yeah. you know, or her, the, because one, one of the dress code rules right. for her was that no jewelry, unless it's a strand of pearls. Right. And she's like, I can't afford pearls because you guys don't pay me enough. Yeah. And then, so they buy her pearls and, ooh, okay. Um, was that, <laughs> is that a thing that happened and recounted in the book? <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> I assumed as much based because there wasn't the big yelly. I don't have enough money for Pearl scene, but um, yeah, it's 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 an interesting addition. Uh, there's a f- handful of those, uh, and we'll get into it um, of characters who are f- who were kind of jerks over the course of the movie, but now they're okay at the end of the movie. We'll talk about it. Does John Glenn and I know the answer to this one ask for the girl, quote unquote, to check the numbers? Hours before he launches uh, for Freedom 7 to circle the Earth. According to legend and Katherine Johnson, this did happen. Yes. But the difference is it wasn't hours before. It was like in the weeks leading up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, that's the dramatic movie thing change. Just as a, just for, yeah. just for, in the movie, it's like while he's walking to yeah. the space She's shuttle. literally like scrambling with a pencil in the calculator <laughs> and, there, and, and the calculator and like punching in numbers as he's walking to the spaceship and in reality it was like in you know in the lead up to it yeah he was like have her check the numbers and if she says they're good i'm good um but yeah it wasn't it wasn't quite so dramatic but you, you know you get it for the movie for the it movie. makes it it's a little silly that he even answers the phone up on the it's like i don't know <laughs> okay i mean sure maybe but like he's up on the, about to get in the space thing, and he's like, gets on the horn. He's like, "Are the numbers good?" And I'm like, "I don't know." That seems silly. We just needed more movie time with not Chris Evans. Oh, we haven't talked about not Chris Evans. Uh, that guy couldn't be less of, but also more of Chris Evans. He is. <laughs> he's dollar store Chris really Evans. and truly dollar store Chris Evans. Uh, there's no way that they weren't. <laughs> like a Chris Evans type in the script or or hopefully Chris Evans and then he was like filming yeah. Captain America 2 or whatever and they're like all right we'll get this guy. Um also that's another thing is that John the, this guy playing John Glenn is like in his 20s. Mm-hmm. John Glenn at the time was like 40 or something yeah. like that. He was or he was like in his late 30s or he was older. He was yeah. significantly older than the portrayal in the movie. Uh and then finally uh did Daddy White Savior uh <laughs> Uh, Kevin Costner uh, let Katherine Johnson into the control room to watch the launch of John Glenn's spaceship. Um, that was not recounted in no. the book. So. Also, the control room, from what I understand, wasn't at Virginia. It yeah. wasn't at Langley. It was down at C- Cape Canaveral yeah. or wherever they launched from. So that obviously... Anyways, so yeah, that wasn't it. That was a, that was a movie edition. All right. That was it. Four was that in the book. I don't have a Lost in Adaptation. Uh, because, you know, not really confused by anything that was going on here. So let's go ahead and talk about what Katie thought was better in the book. You like to read? Oh, yes. I love to read. What do you like to read? Everything. Um, so I have a handful of things under each of my segments. 
Um, a, a lot of what I want to talk about, like, later on in our general notes and in the final verdict is, like, overall yeah. stuff. Um, so I just have a couple of specific things okay. in each of mine. Um, so for better in the book, um, I mean, we've, we've talked about the bathroom thing. There, There's a couple things here that I think were better in the book. The actual story of that they pulled inspiration from for this was, like I said, Mary Jackson. Yeah. Um, and, you know, this happened to her. Um, she wasn't able to find the bathroom that she was allowed to use yeah. over on the other side of the campus. And she was furious about it and storming away. And she bumped into, um, I'm not even going to try his name, Dr. Z the Polish oh, engineer yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, who ends up becoming her mentor. Yeah. And he like sees that she's in a fury and asks her what's wrong. And she just kind of like unloads on yeah. him about this issue with having to run all the way across the campus to the bathroom. And he's like, oh, well, why don't you just come work for me? And that's how she gets the the assignment in engineering. Gotcha. Oh, that's interesting. Um, which I, I thought was interesting. And I, you know, I felt like, if your if your movie has to have like this is the good white character, yeah. you should probably make it like well he's Jewish I guess Polish but Jewish. yeah um white passing character yeah why not make it the person who was actually good good and friendly to her and not <laughs> yeah. just a made up person yeah like who yeah yeah that would have been a, you know seems like that would have made sense. Uh, but no, yeah, I, and he is also in the movie. He's only in it for a few minutes, but he, yeah. I mean, he has a very nice scene with Mary Jackson that we talked about earlier. But um, yeah, I, I don't disagree. Um, the other bathroom thing, bathroom story mm -hmm. in the book was actually about Katherine Johnson, um, and apparently she just flat out ignored any bathroom signs and used any bathroom that she wanted. Um, and by the time anybody said anything to her about it, she was basically like, well, I'm not going to change what I'm doing. So there you go. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. That's a badass moment. They should have given that to somebody at least. If they yeah. Right. Like that sort of subplot to somebody. But that is that is disappointing that they, sac they changed that. They took the sort of <laughs> in retrospect, it's even worse. Yeah, they took the. <laughs> They, they took the fact that they took out the fact that Katherine Johnson actually just didn't give a shit and did and went to the whatever bathroom she wanted to. Yeah. And instead, she had to have Kevin Costner come in and tell her, "No, we all pee the same color. You can use whatever bathroom you want." I'm gonna crowbar down the sign. I'm gonna crowbar the racism right out of this place <laughs> for you, Katherine Johnson. Meanwhile, in real life, she was just like, "I don't." I'm just going to use I'm the bathroom. I'm just going to use the bathroom. <laughs> yeah, that's not great. <laughs> yeah. Um, I had some, I tell you, took some issue with, like, men in general in the movie. Um, I mean, there's, there's the intersectionality with, like, the white men, obviously. Yeah. And I felt like, I felt like the movie did an maybe okay with addressing, like, the intersectionality of racism and sexism. Yeah, it does okay. It at does times. okay with it. Definitely it. shows that it's both things. The the movie also makes the black men in the story kind of sexist. Yeah. Which I mean, probably. Yeah, probably. Probably, but that wasn't the vibe that I got from the book. Yeah. <laughs> like the vibe more that I got from the book was that like Mary Jackson's husband and um uh, Catherine Johnson's um, eventual husband by yeah, the Jim end of the Johnson. movie, Jim Johnson, were like very supportive of them. Yeah. See, that is interesting because I thought Mary Jackson's husband is only in one scene, really. Uh, and I thought his character was interesting. And I didn't get the vibe that he wasn't supportive or that he was supposed to be played as sexist. Jim Johnson was at first. Like his yeah. oh, his introductory scene is. And which would make sense I because can't... he was in, from the military. Like he has yeah. a military background. And that would be at, even more likely probably that he has, you know. I can't remember. They... Uh... 
Mary Jackson's husband had a line early on when they were at the picnic about her like going to school to be an engineer or something. So the, that they're is... there the, his his OK, I got to talk about that because it is a very interesting scene that felt clumsy. What they're going for in that scene, I think, is that I don't think he's telling her because she's a woman that she shouldn't be an engineer. He keeps telling her not to get her hopes up and that she that she shouldn't do this. But the reason he's saying that isn't because he thinks she can't because he also keeps saying you have to just take it like he he's he's like representing a more um sort of uh revolutionary style of he because he's his last line in that scene i think his last line in the movie is sometimes civil rights aren't civil Mm -hmm. which is a good line but like and it's also so i think he was supposed to represent i think his argument with her isn't so much that she shouldn't be trying to be an engineer necessarily, but that because she's a woman or whatever, but that she shouldn't be playing by their rules, by the white man's right, rules. It's what the vibe I got, but it's kind of a, the scene, I would have to watch it again, but the, his, his motivations, or not motivations, maybe motivations slash his message got a little muddled on well, what he was trying to say. obviously it didn't come across clearly yeah. because we interpreted it yeah. different ways well but because he does both which is why it's confusing he at times yeah. says things like oh don't get your hopes up you know you, you're not you, uh, you shouldn't do that or something like it's this weird mixture of i think what they're going for because he has like several lines about again that are like more revolutionary and about how like you know the white people aren't going to let you do that like Mm-hmm. basically saying you can't you can't win in the system that exists like you can sure you want to try to be an engineer you, you, you're going to go to classes and they're going to come up with some other reason you can't be an engineer because that's what white people do and and like he has a it feels like a more myopic and maybe realistic view of sort of the power structure mm-hmm. um and, and maybe and because like i said his last line is he says sometimes civil rights aren't civil but that 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 thesis doesn't go anywhere in the movie, like necessarily, and like his his viewpoint isn't really represented again, because all of the all of our main characters are sort of very much um, trying to play the game within the system that exists, and they're yeah. not trying to like reform the system or like sort of like reinvent the system or anything or tear down the system. They're very much working within the system and playing it in whatever way they can. Um, and playing it well, which there's nothing wrong with that, I think, at times, depending on the situation. You know, But it's an interesting, like, his character was very strange to me because it was such a, a short scene and he had so many things to say. And then we, like, never see him again and he never says anything else to the rest of the movie. And I was like, well, was like I thought, like, we were going to see him later, like, getting arrested at, like, mm-hmm. a riot or something. Like, I thought, like, that would have made sense as, like, another touchstone later with his character and nothing ever came of it. So it was... I don't know. I thought it was weird, but if you go watch that scene again, I, yeah, I'm not sure what their dynamic was supposed to be and what he was supposed to be saying other than, like, Yeah, and I I read it as, like, him not being particularly supportive of her, which, based on his portrayal in the book, not that the men are in the book a ton, yeah. but it did seem a little unfair to me, which is why I made a note about it. And that's fair. Yeah. I, and I could see that because there's lines you could read that way. I just think it was supposed to be a little more nuanced and that maybe it didn't come across. I think it was supposed to be that he was supportive, but also that he didn't support her trying to play the game in the system because the system always <laughs> screws over yeah people like that and i i I don't know it was yeah it was interesting um so in the movie they have a whole separate room in the cafeteria there's a whole separate colored room yeah which i don't know how realistic that would have been but yeah um it is more dramatic it would have it probably would have been realistic at some places i don't know yeah nasa but um in the book they have a table with a sign um, oh yeah and they keep taking down the sign and they like the i guess the administrators or whoever keep putting the sign back out and they just keep taking it and they keep putting it back out yeah and it like goes round and round until finally whoever at the school is putting the sign out just gives up <laughs> <laughs> yeah oh i also read that by the time it was nasa it was fully integrated that, um, I believe that's accurate. Yeah, yeah, and that it was NACA that wasn't, but that by the time they got to NASA, it was it was no longer segregated. They didn't have segregated anything anymore, supposedly. I think I mm-hmm. think that's what I read. But 
I thought uh, the movie handled the romantic subplot a little clumsily. With Jim Johnson. Yeah, like it's not terrible. I just There's not enough. It's of it. not enough of it. It was kind of like randomly interspersed throughout to the point where I was like, eh, I could do without this. Yeah. Eh. It's well, it's it's frustrating because the payoff scene is you it should land more better than it does. Like when he proposes to her, like yeah. that's the big payoff. And it, it felt like it should land because it's a really sweet scene and it land, it still lands, but that's primarily, I think because of how good all the actors are in it. Like Marshall mm-hmm. Ali is really good. And, uh, and Taraji P Henson, um, their performances are really good. So it still worked for me, but it, it's like, we'd seen two, two very short scenes with yeah. them before that. So it didn't really, have much leading up Andy to it. was a jerk in his first and in scene. The, one of those scenes he was a, a bit yeah. of a jerk so. and there's there's not enough at least for me there wasn't enough like to redeem him following that no yeah the, and because it wasn't the point but yeah. they still wanted to include it yeah I guess and so yeah it, it, it's yeah a, it was just kind of clumsily yeah wedged into the story I think they could have completely not had it in there and it would have been fine I would have been fine with but, it but I think there wasn't any need yeah. for it but I mean, it, it, it's an important part of her life. Potentially, I could I, I could see an argument for it either way. But it still felt like maybe we just focus on her career, yeah, <laughs> and not her husband, yeah, uh, you know that sort of thing. But uh, whatever. Although, side note, I don't recall if the movie brings this up or not. Um, but she was a, a, a bit older than him. Oh yeah, yeah. He when when they met, she was forty and he was thirty three. Oh, not like a huge okay. age. Gap, I thought you meant like but a little more. Yeah, not a huge age right. gap, but, but a little older. But a little older. I don't think like, the movie addresses it. Go, Catherine. They look like the same age in the movie. Get it, girl. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, so my last note here, um, is a, a story that did not make it into the movie that I was kind of disappointed didn't make it into the movie. Okay. Um, so Dorothy, after she becomes a supervisor, um, makes it her mission to, and I think they did mention this in like the end credits, um, she makes it her mission to help like all women yeah. advance through it the is in like the sub. It is yeah. in like the, yeah. Yeah, it's in the... Um, the Breakfast Club The Breakfast close. Club close. <laughs> Um, but there is a specific, like, short little um, story in the book where she finds out that um, a white woman was denied a raise that, like, she should have gotten mm-hmm. according to the rules. Yeah. So she goes and reminds them and, like, basically throws, well, the rules are the rules back in their faces nice. and gets that woman the raise. Which I thought could have been like a cool moment. Yeah, yeah, it really could have been. They could have even had it been Kristen Dunst's character. They could have. That would have been better than well, what, what how that ends in the movie. But we'll talk about it. All right, that was it for better in the book. Let's go ahead and talk about better in the movie. My life has taught me one lesson, Hugo, and not the one I thought it would. Happy endings only happen in the movies. I don't know that it's super realistic, but I get why the movie makes these main three good friends. Yeah. Um, I, they definitely all knew they each knew other. They knew each other, they yeah. def- I think they were friends, at least to some extent. I don't think they were, like, bosom buddies. You didn't get the vibe from the book yeah. that they were, like, hanging out all yeah, the time. Yeah, they were, like, like, a close threesome. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I get it. Yeah. It's definitely a storytelling choice. Yeah. Um, I loved the scene where Dorothy steals a book from the library. Yeah. I don't think real life Dorothy would have done that, but I thought it was a good movie scene. Yeah. And it is, it's funny. I, I, when I was looking at Dorothy's Wikipedia article and it said she learned how to code or, or how to do the programming for the computer and she, she got a book about the computer language or whatever and taught herself and i clicked on because it is it's called fortrum or whatever Mm -hmm. and i clicked on it and on the wikipedia article for that the wikipedia picture is that book with that cover from the movie (laughs) i was like oh that's literally the book that it's in the movie right now um i liked that the movie incorporated some like historical footage yeah i i enjoy when 
yeah. like historical movies that you know that are supposed to be about real events do that yeah and they they did an interesting job pretty good job of mixing it too where mm-hmm. you got you'd have some where it was like historical right next to something made to look historical like with yeah. the reporters and stuff and they kind of hybrid did that and i thought it worked well yeah yeah um, and the book didn't even have pictures, so... Yeah. It would have been cool, at least in the book, to see some of them. Some pictures, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I really liked Mary's speech to the judge. It's a great speech. It's a great speech. Yeah. Like we talked about, not historically accurate. No. But a great speech, powerful moment. Mm-hmm. Dorothy's zinger line... Oh, it's a great scene. ...to Kirsten Dunst's character, whose name I have already forgotten. Kirsten Dunst. Karen. It's probably Karen. It's probably Karen. <laughs> Do we ever even learn her first name? I, I don't know. I hope not. I don't know. Um, <laughs> or potentially Linda. Yeah. She could be a Linda. Um, where uh, Kirsten Dunst's character is like, I don't have anything against you all, or whatever she says. Yeah. Something like that. She says, I just want you to know I don't have anything against you all. And she says, you all or you all yeah. or whatever. And uh, Dorothy's like, I know. I know you probably believe that. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, got him. It's a great moment that is undercut when later in the movie, Kirsten Dunst shows up and is like, gives her a... Like... That should have been the end of their exchange. Like, that should have been the end of it. But, like, later, and it's like, Kirsten Dunst has to realize the error of her ways. And does, Am I misremembering this? That she shows up and talks to Dorothy, and it's like, oh, just want to let you know uh, yeah. this thing or something. Uh, yeah, and I, I know it's supposed to read, like, oh, that exchange made her reflect and, like... yeah. Because then, cause then Dorothy's like, thank you, like thanks her for something, and then she leaves, and it feels like they're supposed to have been like a slight, like, I don't know, rec- like, uh, mm-hmm. whatchamacallit, what is the word? Um, reconciliation. reconciliation there or something. And it just felt like it cheapened that moment with the the, the line you just mentioned, but I, I don't know. Because I, I felt that way. Is that every single like jerky character in the movie got like a recon like a reconciliation like actually look they learned to not be racist yeah. and it's like okay I'm glad I want people to learn to not be racist but like every single character in the movie just yeah. learns to not be racist by the end and honestly I'm gonna be real honest. The Kirsten Dunst character one bothers me a little less than the Jim Parsons yeah. character one because he didn't even have like a, a zinger moment. exchange no, moment. No, he didn't have anything to like think on. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. At least she had something to think on. Yeah, that's fair. It's just yeah, because yeah, at the end of the movie, so he so Jim Parsons character is like the main engineer or whatever or whatever his job is. I don't know. He's yeah. He's like a her direct boss or whatever. And he's been a jerk to her the whole film and uh, clearly racist and misogynistic and um, but never overtly. So I will give the movie credit for that. He's never like he he keeps it sort of it's it's a it's a more subtle. Yeah, a little. I mean, he's still a jerk, but like it's not, you know, he never calls her girl or, you know, like yeah. or anything weird. Um, but he uh, only John Glenn does <laughs> That's even in even in, I thought that was funny that the girl like I don't know well I think it's potentially not I think it was supposed to be like a maybe endearing more than it was yeah he meant it maybe more endearing than it sounds now like in from I a think 2020 so. yeah potentially um hopefully but uh yeah Jim Spark- Parsons character is just a jerk the whole movie and then at the end he's just like brings her coffee yeah like, actually <laughs> like- you're smart and I like you now here have coffee I brought you. I respect you now, right. even though you are black and a woman. <laughs> and like okay. it's like, why does everybody just get that moment where we're just like, and now they're they're better now. See, you don't have to feel bad, white people. Don't feel uncomfortable. They all got better, and they're all good now. And it's all fine. And racism solved. We solved it, guys. In the '60s, look, we solved it in the '60s. I think that's the thing that bothers me is that you get the end. It gets to the end, and it's like, look. Look, everybody got along. Six, yeah. Wrapped it all. It's all clean now. Yeah. They're like, oh yeah. You know what I mean? Like it's done now. Like even in the '60s, they all figured out that racism. 
it's like uh, no <laughs> no I don't know. It just, it didn't, it didn't sit. The, some of those little like wrap ups didn't yeah. sit super right with me. No, I agree. But anyways. All right. That was it for better in the movie. Oh, no, it's not. No. I, have one, I have one more thing. Oh, well, it's not on my list. Oh, is it not? Nope. Oh. The last one I have is, I know you probably believe that. That's weird. Anyways, go ahead. Anyway, um, so this is kind of an overall thing. The movie definitely tells a much simpler, easier to follow, arguably more impactful story yeah. than the book. I, I enjoyed the book, um, and I thought for a nonfiction piece, it, it reads a bit like a novel. Yeah. Um, but it does meander. Yeah. Uh, it stretches across a couple decades. Um, there's a lot of, like, we follow mainly the same three as in the movie but there are a lot of like kind of smaller offshoots where we follow different people for a little while um there's a lot of different stories it jumps back and forth between those main three there's some time hopping so like there were aspects of it that were difficult to keep track of yeah that just wasn't an issue with the movie because the movie is telling like one story start to finish yeah which that is one of the other things that is different about the movie versus history in the book is that it does condense yes events yeah severely from when <laughs> down to uh you know taking place within a year or two yeah with things that actually took place over like you said decades um but that's pretty standard for historical movies because things happen slowly over time not in two hours <laughs> or two and a half <laughs> hours or whatever so gotta gotta condense it down all right now let's talk about what the movie nailed As I expected, practically perfect in every way. Um, I just have a couple little things here. I kind of had to stop like trying to track stuff that the movie nailed because yeah. there were so many things that were tweaked like a just enough that yeah. I didn't feel comfortable putting them in this category. Yeah. Um, but the the movie opens with um little Catherine. Like yeah, counting yeah. everything, yeah, yeah, yeah. and apparently that was something that she did as huh. a kid. It was like she just counted things. Yeah. Um. So I thought it was interesting that they incorporated that. Um. And then they talk about her getting to skip ahead two grades, yeah. which is also something that happened. Yeah. Um. Management dragging their feet to make Dorothy a supervisor, even though she was already doing the supervisor job. That's something that's discussed in the book. Yeah. Um. And then uh. Mary Jackson's mentor um, does encourage her to try and become Zarnicky. an engineer. Yeah, Zarnicky. Probably something like that. Something like that. Which it's slightly different in the movie, I think. But yeah. Yeah. Cool. Those are the yeah. So yeah. those those are my couple little things that I had in there. No. Like you said, there were other things, but again, it's everything's a little bit yeah tweaked or amped up or you know for film and that sort of thing. So all right, let's go ahead. And do oh wait no odds and ends we're not in the final verdict yet we got a few odds and ends so speaking of the historical accuracy I found this on the Wikipedia page which I thought was interesting and I don't know uh, so I've heard of this uh, so there's a blog called Information is Beautiful which I've heard of before. And they uh, did somehow did some sort of calculation, some sort of math, some sort of, I say calculation. They did something and they deduced that if you take sort of creative license into account, probably things like pushing events closer together and sort of smaller tweaks that aren't super important, Mm -hmm. um, like like the, the John Glenn checking the calculations being in the hours leading up to as opposed to in the weeks leading up to or whatever. You know, those kind of tweaks where it's like, that is what happened, but just slightly different. Um, They found that the movie was 74% accurate when compared to real life events. That's passing. Yeah. And their summary was, the crux of the story is true, and any events that didn't actually happen, or at least are at least illustrative of how things really were. Which is what we talked about at times, where there's like a lot of things that were um, maybe not exactly what happened but were illustrative of uh, certain attitudes and, and that sort of thing at the mm-hmm. time. Um, yeah, I think that's a, a pretty fair assessment. Yeah. Um, 
you know, I, I think portrayal of racism. I don't think they were talking about that necessarily. Yeah. It's more so the historical stuff, but like the events or whatever yeah. versus like the attitudes and that sort of thing. But sorry, continue. I was just going to say that I, I don't, I feel like it's all, maybe always going to be at least a little bit ham fisted. Yeah. Like because of the way that we tell stories yeah. and there's stories just, are th- ham fisted yeah. kind of by nature. And it's it's hard, I think, to make it true to life. Yeah. Because what's true to life is subtle. Yeah. And is not always noticeable. And it's not always going to, like, serve the purposes of the story that you're trying to tell. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, I, and I think the movie, like we mentioned, I think it does do a fairly good job with a lot of some of – with some of the subtleties of – the depiction of racism. Mm-hmm. I think where it falters it's the most is sort of where it wraps up like cer- certain scenes like we talked about, like the bathroom scene and stuff. And then just like like the way it kind of wraps up and, and puts a neat, tidy bow on the yeah. racism of the movie and, and yeah. solves it all. Yeah. Which and leaves I, the like, audience feeling good, but... and I, Yeah, uh, and I, I understand the impulse to do that. I understand to want to like end your movie on like this is a nice note, yeah, and we're all gonna walk away from this feeling good, yeah, because you want your audience to walk away feeling yeah. good. I mean, if you're telling like a nice story, yeah. <laughs> um, but it, I mean, it's also good to have your audience walk away with like something to chew on. So maybe yeah. we don't redeem like every single, yeah, yeah. That's Dirty, my big thing. White racist yeah. character. <laughs> maybe we just figure out a way to make it a little more realistic. Yeah. And then some of the people are still racist and maybe there's still some problems we need to fix yeah. in the world. And we didn't solve it in 1962 because John Glenn smiled at Catherine Johnson and then went to space. Like, <laughs> you know, I don't know. It just it, it just feels a little, yeah, a little a little easy. Um, but at the same time, I think the thing that struck me about the film is that it's because it is even some of the scenes are a little like. A, a, a little um arch and like a little uh you know yeah. melodramatic but it it i think it were, would work really well which is a, one of the things we talked about in the prequel that was the case that a lot this was a it's a family movie and it was made for kids to see mm-hmm. and to be something to hopefully inspire young uh women young people of color um just anybody you know who to to see that you don't have to fit into whatever specific idea of a scientist or of a a mathematician or whatever um, to go into those roles. And so they really were trying to make a movie that worked for younger audiences. And I think maybe sometimes for younger audiences, a little bit more of these like arch moments that are, you know, the, the quote unquote ham fisted moments Mm -hmm. play better and are easier for kids to realize what's going on. No, yeah, I I agree. Yeah. So I can think you could make that argument potentially that you kind of have to, uh, make some of the portrayals a little uh, dial certain scenes up and stuff so, mm-hmm. so kids get what's going on and and sort of understand the overall message mm-hmm. potentially. Yeah. And I, there's definite white savior yeah. stuff going on in yeah. this. I think if we like stacked it up against like your helps or your green books it's, it's- it probably, probably ranks a little lower. A little lower. On the white savior o- odometer. I would argue a little lower. <laughs> I have not seen the green book. I have seen the help, but it was forever ago, and it was before my I thought about any of that sort of stuff yeah. at all. Like, I saw it when it came out, and it was, you know, sort of critical analysis and sort of left, it, you know, like progressive uh, – Critical analysis was not a thing that I even considered at the time, so I I wouldn't have even known what to look for. Um, but uh, yeah, it does strike me as it's it's not great at times, but yeah. it's not awful. Like, and I think overall it has a good message, and the point of the movie is good. If we just took the crowbar bathroom <laughs> scene yeah. out, yeah, just replace <laughs> that 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 plot that subplot with the part where she just is using the wrong bathroom. Yeah quote unquote wrong bathroom and uh just keeps doing it and then somebody confronts her about it and you know write write that version of yeah. it where it's like th- that bathroom subplot is what happens instead of what happens in the movie and i think it's a, a you you lose that big problematic like white savior moment and you also 
add more agency and and, and just it's more interesting yeah. uh, depiction of Katherine Johnson's character to do that, I think, than what they ultimately did in the movie. So, did you catch the symbolism with the coffee cups? No, it was really subtle. What I must have missed it. Oh, I didn't think it was subtle at all. No, I'm, I'm <laughs> maybe I'm being subtle. I was. <laughs> It's not subtle. It's not subtle. It's not subtle at all. It's, uh, it's like 12 it's like, white coffee mugs. Oh, look at all those white coffee mugs. And then she's clutching her one lone brown coffee mug. Man. they Do, do symbolism more, guys. <laughs> do symbolism. I did a symbolism in my movie. <laughs> yeah. It, I mean, you know. Yeah. I get it. I would I probably do that, I guess. I. Yeah. It. But it's... it's mm. <laughs> uh kirsten dunst plays a really great hateable white lady like she she's does. it's hers is subtle but real good like real like oh you're the worst you're the worst and you don't even know you're the worst <laughs> i liked that a lot i thought that was fun i thought her character was fun but she did a really good like restrained yeah job with her acting yeah in this. she's really good i she i think she's got nominated for a bunch of awards for that there's some show she's in like the tales of a something oh i don't house. know I, I can't it's like something florida or i don't remember but she's in some tv show or like star show or something that apparently she's great in she plays like a trailer truck tra- trailer trash mom or something hmm. i don't know it's got a weird name um but she won i think she's won a bunch of awards for it um is she yeah she's great she's really good in it meanwhile jim parsons i felt like was kind of kind of playing just a 1960s version of sheldon uh yeah he's i mean he's, he bit. doesn't have the sort he doesn't of weird... have like the like the weird quirky yeah the 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 slightly problematic depiction of autism that, yeah the, the... um yeah um so like the not that element of it but like the element where he just plays this character who's like but that's just the way it is yeah you know yeah like a 1960s version of that yeah yeah for sure on becoming a god in central florida is the name of the show it's a showtime show it's only one season so far season two comes out soon well i shudder to think what kind of god you'd become in central Florida. yeah she was nominated for the golden globe for Hmm. that good Um, for her and it's in 1992 central florida a minimum wage water park employee lies schemes and cons her way up the ranks of the cultish multi-billionaire dollar pyramid scheme that drove her family to ruin it's interesting hmm. sounds interesting i've heard it's good but anyways yeah jim parsons what a, what a guy <laughs> what, a, what an actor <laughs> I just I don't have anything against him. I just feel like he always has the same look on his face. He does have a look and he he goes back to that well a lot and it's that same it's the Sheldon face look. Yeah. Whatever that is. It's just what his face <laughs> looks like, I guess. All right. Let's go ahead and do it. Final verdict. Now. Uh, are you ready for your sentence? Sentence? But there must be a verdict first. Sentence first. Verdict afterwards. Ah, uh, this is a tough one. I have been thinking about it as we were talking it over. Say, my notes don't have a final verdict. They yeah. say, I will figure it out, basically. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we're kind of weighing, like, what's more important, your historical accuracy or your telling a good story your thematic narrative yeah your thematic narrative um i think i'm gonna have to go with the book okay on this one i would have predicted after the movie that you were gonna pick the movie but i really enjoyed the movie yeah i i enjoyed both i think both are worth your time Mm -hmm. i think that the book tells a fuller story yeah I think that it does a better job of discussing what the social climate actually was yeah. at this time and in this place. And less of the Disney depiction of what, yeah. um, of what that it was. Yeah. Yeah. Not, and, I, and I did really enjoy the movie. Yeah. And I think the movie is fully worth your time. Mm-hmm. Um, it does tell a really great story, a really inspiring story. Um, but I, I think, you know, especially if you've already seen it, 
and you feel like you want to know more or you want to know more accurate things, definitely read the book. I think this is definitely one where the book, it would be where the movie is a great jumping off point. Yeah. It's a a nice, succinct, two hour, uh, compelling narrative. Uh, It's a really well made movie, great performances uh, that really gets you interested in the story because enough of it is true and accurate. Mm That you, um, that finding out there was a book, you would be, I would be really interested to go. Now, like I said, I've read like all the Wikipedia pages, so I don't know if I'll read the book, but really interesting to then go from the movie and to see what actually, you know, how the events actually transpired and to get a more fleshed out, yeah, feel for, uh, these women and the people who, uh, you know, and the society they existed in at the time, that sort of thing. Yeah. Cool. Book wins, but barely. But barely. All right. Before we get to our next, uh, before we announce what our next film and book will be, we're going to remind you that you can do this the greatest of favors and go to patreon.com slash this film is lit and support us for two, five or $15 a month. And when you get there, you'll see what all those different levels do. Uh, $2 is early access. $5 is bonus content, which we have an episode will be out before too long. We have something. We have something in mind. Of what we're going to talk about that may interest like six people. (laughs) But we're currently watching two TV shows with similar titles that are very different. (laughs) And we're we're almost done with both of them. And we're probably going to talk about... And they're both old. Not old. Uh, One of them ended in... They're no longer airing. One of them ended in 2018 and the other one ended in like 2014, 15... Uh, nothing alike, neither, not alike not, at all, not even but close. the titles of the two shows are very similar. I want to see if anybody can fit anybody, <laughs> like if anybody p- puts it together and is like, duh, 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 and figures out which, uh, two shows we're talking about. Uh, one more hint. One of them's Canadian. There you go. Um, the show. Uh, so w- we were probably do a bonus episode about that. Uh, we're going to talk about both of those shows, uh, before too long. We're, like I said, we're almost done with both of those. Uh, and you get the access to that at the $5 level. And then at the $15 level, you get all that stuff plus priority recommendations, which we've done several of, including Mortal Engines. Uh, I'm skipping Christmas yes. slash Christmas with the Cranks. Um, and then Mortal Engines. And then we have another one coming up soon. We have another one coming up Perfect. within the next three episodes. Perfect. We have another one coming up in just a few episodes. So uh, that you can support us on Patreon and get all that stuff. But if you can't right now, we get it and we understand and we still love you. Thanks for listening. If you can't support us, you can do us another huge favor that's free is you can go to iTunes and give us a five star review uh, or five star rating and leave a review. Helps a lot. Uh, get our show out there even more. So all that said, Katie, what's next? Well, up next, we are going to be talking about a book called Derby Girl. Oh, yeah. Um, Written by Shauna... Mallway tweet. Oh, okay. Shauna Cross. <laughs> Not Shauna Mallway tweet. Um, no. <laughs> Which was made into a film. Yeah. Called Whip It. Whip It. I've never seen Whip It, but I've always wanted to. Uh, so it's about roller derby. Yeah. That's fun. We'll just leave it at that for now. We'll talk about <laughs> it more later. If you follow Katie on Instagram, you may know why we're doing it. Um, well, one of the reasons. So, that is our next one, uh, the uh, Ellen Page vehicle. She's the main character, I believe. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know anything else. I think Drew Barrymore directed it? I think you're right, yeah. I think yeah. Drew Barrymore directed yeah. it, um, if I remember correctly. But yeah, I, yeah I've it. never seen it. I'm really excited to see it. I, I am also excited to see it. I'm interested to see how it compares to the book, because I did not know it was a book. Um, but yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah. Whip it, slash Derby Girl, two weeks. There you go. Until that time, guys, gals, non-binary, and everybody else, keep reading books, keep watching movies, and and keep keep being being awesome. awesome.